you know, we're in that kind of era of change. But if I go back to the beginning and with two numbers and, and say, number one, 76% of your end clients think that their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. Every client in every industry, in every town, city, province, around the world are going through massive transformations around how they're going to work with customers, their customers. If you can be on the inside of that, there's huge opportunities to help them drive their businesses forward and digitize, become tech companies in many cases themselves, regardless of the industry that they're in. Hi, everyone. In episode 11, we have the pleasure of hosting Jay McBain, who is an industry thought leader in all things ecosystems. He recently speaks often about the decade of ecosystems and provides incredible insights into the changing models of buyers, different behaviors, and the way the channel is transforming in a new digital ecosystem in the digital economy. Two really big takeaways that I took from the conversation with Jay, and particularly as it relates to the local region and the way the world is changing, is that 80% or so of buyers are talking about how their business models will be completely unrecognizable in the next five to 10 years. So the whole way of doing business is completely changing. And secondly, partners and ecosystems are looking now at the multiplier effect instead of traditional product resale. And you can see big macro forces like the rise of marketplaces, changing into point systems and all sorts of differentiations in programs that are really affecting this. We love speaking with Jay. He's always so insightful and we trust you'll get so much out of this episode. Enjoy. Amazing. Jay McBain, thank you so much for joining us on the Dark Mode podcast. It's great to have you. Well, thank you for so much for having me. We have crossed paths in the past and was really impressed with what we were speaking about just prior, which is the sphere of influence and all things ecosystems. And now that you're over in the new role at Canalyst from Forrester Days, um, I'm sure we're going to see a lot of insights around the trends you're seeing in the market and as it pertains to technology and cybersecurity. So really appreciate your insights. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. This is uh, getting my, I track a lot of spheres of influence and I track some of the biggest and best podcasts for millions of people around the world. And boy, have you guys hit your stride in a very quick amount of time. So congratulations on that. Yeah, thanks so much. We're very stoked about it. So keep going. But you know, it's the currencies in the audience and especially the guests. So we want to always bring value and meaningful insights. And I think Ben and I are natural rabbit holers, <laughs> technical term. And so, you know, as soon as I can get as deep into a conversation, the better, because I just really love speaking about a lot of the macro trends. So, yeah. And just great. quickly, Jay, happy fourth uh, for yesterday. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Did you, did you get out too much? What was the uh, celebration? Typical well, fireworks so, uh, and beers. I happen to be married on July the 4th. So uh, every year Excellent. I get a long weekend as an anniversary and obviously fireworks uh, uh, every uh, anniversary night. So uh, that all comes for free as part of the anniversary. <laughs> so it's good. And I'm also originally Canadian. So July the 1st is uh, Canada Day and then July 4th is uh, you know Independence Day in the US. So it's always kind of a long weekend wrapped against my two citizenships. That's amazing. Well, you have nailed that. That is like yeah. the ultimate timing. And you'll never forget it. It's yeah. never, never forget it either. Yeah. <laughs> so good. So Jay, maybe to start off with, what's like a big mega trend that you think would be relevant to a Asia Pacific audience around cybersecurity at the moment? Yeah, I mean, talk about a number of, of trends all going at once. You know, first and foremost, I look at the market in terms of how business is done. So I, I think of partnerships, I think of ecosystems at scale, and there's probably more change happening in APAC around partnerships at this moment than any time in the last 40 years. You know, we've been monitoring it. When I look at things like, you know, new subscription and consumption models starting yeah. to come into the region, we've had obviously SaaS companies and cloud companies, for example, in the US for 20 plus years. You know, for the first time now, we're starting to see a big part of the Asia Pac business change, you know, in terms of model. We're starting to see things like marketplaces start to take hold where, you know, one third the US economy runs via marketplace, especially given the pandemic. You know, that's starting to come into the APAC region. 
terms of security, we watched 4,300 security companies who are building technology, software, hardware, different kinds of services to attack the, the problem in different ways. And now 2,000 of them have created a channel program. They've started to work with partners, create channel technology and things like that. So it's exciting. But in the APAC region now, many of these companies have now hired people locally and for you know managed security solution providers and for managed providers and for bars and integrators and their, their phones are buzzing, their email inboxes are growing in terms of thousands of people now that are phoning them that have designed the perfect mousetrap uh, in security. So that's what we're hearing from the region. It's just the, the, the noise and the clutter yeah. is at a pace now that maybe you know, we would have heard uh, in different parts of the world five or 10 years ago, but it's now hitting a deafening pace. And so it's not about the latest threat vector. It's not a, about the growing surface area and things like that. It's the complexity of how to put together layers of a solution inside when 2000 people are calling me, you know, offering up the latest and greatest. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have seen that been on the forefront of even that at NextGen Group as a, as a key distributor in the region because Ben and I built the cybersecurity business and just the sheer influx of new market entrants, new vendor technologies. And, you know, there's a very famous cyberscape graphic from Momentum Cyber where you throw it up on the, on the first fly deck and it's an eyesore because there's just thousands and thousands of new technologies and they have entered the market like you described, Jay, and some of the most strategic partnerships that I work with every day are just like, wow, how do we make sense of this? Where do things fit in? Because also cybersecurity is such a complex problem. It's going to require different areas of expertise and there's new threats arising every day. So very interesting what we are seeing in this region. Yeah. And that's only scraping the surface. So that's what partners here. Yeah. And so most of the budget from these companies are obviously trying to get in front of end customers. Mm. So you can imagine the noise and clutter at their level. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, selling in as product led growth or selling in as kind of a consumption model, almost like a free entry model into, you know, solving problems, let's say at a director level. And now you're getting into this world where we were in SaaS years ago, which is this rogue buyer, this uh, shadow IT insecurity, which, which is the exact place that it shouldn't be. Yeah. Where at a departmental level, you have people, you know, attempting to solve problems that ought to be solved at a higher level or, you know, by different people and different things competing on the network to protect it, which in the case is making it more vulnerable than, than mm. ever before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the other trends that, you know, really happened in other places of the world first is the, the partnership themselves, the, the companies that are, you're using to implement and integrate some of your security strategy, companies that you're using for compliance, companies that you're using for different levels of data and automation and, and other places in this, the consultants, the architects, the designers, there are millions of companies, you know, that are talking security but them themselves becoming targets. And so for the first time this year, the United States president started name dropping security companies that were breached. And it wasn't the company themselves because you know almost every company is obviously a, a threat vector, but it's now these smaller companies. On average, you know, in the managed services or MSSB space I mentioned, the average company has eight people. You know, they don't have a SOC, they don't have a NOC, they don't have the capability. So they're basically representing larger companies. But by getting access to end clients through the networks that they've given access, the keys to these small companies that don't have the capacity or capability to lock it down, now becomes a bigger threat. So they're attacking through the tools and the tools are being run by, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of now small companies that themselves are the threat factor. And so this is causing governments to step in and through le legislation and regulation, compliance and governance to try to figure out how to protect, you know, from a national security perspective, how to attack, uh, how to, you know, protect end clients. So th this is all, you know, in the last six months. 
And it's all hitting home where, you know, this study of partnerships is intersecting and it's an overlapping Venn diagram now of just studying security itself. Well, in the last six months, you're right, Joe, we've had so many big tech companies be hit as a result of third party access. You know, Opt is a great example, uh, NVIDIA, Microsoft, you know, the, the crew that were responsible behind all of them knew the keys to the kingdom across all of it were those small third party MSSPs or MSPs that had access not just directly to a bank of clients, they had an access to a bank of technology suites that they could then shift left into to access the wider kingdom. It's, it's not going to slow down, unfortunately. Yeah. So bring in some numbers, 24% of companies around the world in every industry, uh, in every geography, have handed over their keys. Either they outsource some or all of their IT. And so now you enter into hundreds of thousands of companies they've handed the keys to. And those companies might be running tools like Kaseya, SolarWinds, ConnectWise, all yep. three that have been breached. Two of the three that, again, the president name dropped you know, from, the, from the, the White House, from the Oval Office, which I didn't think in my 28 year career, I would have the you know, president of the United States name dropping vendors in the partnership space. Yeah. But guess what? This is a, you know, a back door into, you know, end customer networks. And we're not talking about flower shops and daycare centers, your utilities, your, your water company, your electric company, uh, some of the, uh, you know, governments, uh, departments. Uh, are outsourced. They've outsourced some or all of their IT. And again, they've had to hand out the admin passwords to do that. And to do the remote management necessary, the tools that are doing that are under attack. And you know, talk about just spreading out the, the surface area of this and understanding the layers of, of complexity here. And it just comes into my world very, very quickly. Yeah, just for sure. I was just going to say, Gabe, quickly for the audience, there might be some listeners that are struggling to keep up with where we're at. So MSPs or MSSPs typically have what's called a jump host, which is a virtual node. Uh, essentially, it's just a virtual computer that gives them access into a client's environment. Um, and then from there, they're able to manage that client environment. And typically, at the moment, we're seeing a lot of, and, uh, and this is part of the reason why they're being breached so easily, is that the jump host or the virtual node is the most vulnerable point in said network. Uh, it just doesn't have the security wrappers required uh, for such an access gateway. Yeah, and so, so it's a one-to-many problem. Is If you are a hacker, you can work on a very particular you know, end customer for a particular reason, and, and then we know the, uh, the efforts that are underway there and how long it takes usually mm. you know, to find, find a way in. If you level up those efforts and, and focus at a layer higher, it may be the same amount of time, same amount of effort, but now you've found a backdoor to perhaps thousands or tens of thousands of clients uh, for the same amount of work. And so this is just why the, 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 the problem is elevated. And we're talking about one quarter of the companies in, in the world that have handed over some set of keys and jump posts, as you said, and why we're examining this at, at this level, and obviously why governments and regulators are starting to get you know very much involved. This yeah, is where, a wild statistic. Yeah. Sorry, go. I was going to say, Jay, and this is perhaps a good segue into describing a lot of your thought leadership around the rise in the decade of the ecosystems. So, could you explain that and that journey and what that means? Yeah. So, very simply, when you look at world trade, the ninety-four trillion dollars that got exchanged last year in world GDP, 75% of it flowed indirectly. So you bought your last car from a dealer, you bought your last TV from a retailer, you bought your last jar of peanut butter from a grocer. Almost everything we do in our personal and professional lives goes through others. It doesn't go through the manufacturer, the company of the product you're buying. You know, some of the famous examples of direct companies like Dell, you know, you bought a, might have bought a computer back in the 1990s from Dell directly. They used to run commercials making fun of the channel. Well, in their latest quarterly earnings of $104 billion, 58% of that is now indirect. So the company that used to make fun of the channel is now 58% channel. So in that 75% of the world that goes indirectly, we've kind of called them for decades channels, channels of distribution. It goes through wholesale, it goes through distribution, it goes through 
one or two tier resale or dealers or brokers or agents, depending on the industry. Well, today, the, the world's kind of turning upside down for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is Accenture went out and did a survey across end customers in every industry, in every country of the world. 76% of CEOs think that their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. And ecosystems are the number one reason why. Companies, whether you're a pharmaceutical company, a bank, insurance company, you, you think of the current car companies that are building computers on wheels. They can't go at it alone anymore. They're thinking about new subscription and consumption models. They're thinking about selling through marketplaces. They're thinking about product-led growth models. There's all kinds of things going on. But in the end, all of these future models of every company in every industry wraps around partnerships. And it's not so exciting anymore to talk about who collects the customer's money. So when you buy that jar of peanut butter or you buy that car, it's pretty well known how to you know, recruit those kind of partners, how to incent them, how to educate them and train them. And there's about a hundred areas of complexity around doing that at scale. But that's part of the conversation. The ecosystem, why there's a different word, is really for non-transacting partners. So we know a lot now about how business is done. And we know more now than ever that when you make a considered purchase, when I buy a piece of security software from Palo Alto, when I consider buying a mattress, when I buy a car, on average, there's 28 moments that I'll spend, like listening to a podcast like this, like talking to a neighbor, like going to a social media group, going to an event, joining an association. I mean, there's all kinds of things I do, but there's going to be 28 moments on average before I make vendor selection. And those 28 moments now become everything. The owners of those moments, are less likely to be people that will collect the customer's money. They don't have the cash register. They don't show up at the point of sale, but they definitely show up at the point of influence. Another thing happened just recently is the end of the cookie. So companies from a marketing perspective used to just buy up these lists because either Facebook or Google, somebody would be happy to share that data with you for the right price. Well, that's gone now. Apple was the first to remove that privacy cookie data. Google is begrudgingly following suit. In this world of no cookies, every company, when you're selling a considered product, which is you know, something that's more expensive, we're not talking about a candy bar or a bag of chips here, uh, which you're going to buy uh, you know, based on you know, you're hungry. Uh, <laughs> it's something you're going to spend money on and have to think about. You, know, you have to get obsessed now over those 28 moments and who owns them. Mm. If a company doesn't land you know, in front of one of those 4,000 security companies without listening to this podcast, you two become one of those important moments that it behooves these companies to understand who you are and, and how that influence works. And there might be 27 other moments as well. So that gives you an example of non-transactional partnerships. And there might be you know, 4,000 companies you know, shortly that are reaching out to you to see if there's a level of attribution of the work you're doing that might end up in you know, the, the sale of a security product, the 60 billion of security software that's sold every year. They might also you know, be considering how to do data sharing. You know, be great for them to know who the listeners are. So that is a signal that they would have paid for before from somebody else through a MarTech or AdTech stack. Now they have to think about it through a partnership stack. So one of the things I do is I publish a channel ecosystem some landscape, the 223 companies that allow companies to do those partnerships before the point of sale, at the point of sale, there are partners that assist in that point of sale that don't actually collect the customer's money. 24% of marketplace activity today, like at AWS and Microsoft and Google and Salesforce and other places, are partners on behalf of the customer, configuring, pricing, quoting, and then pressing a buy button on their behalf. So that's transaction assist, but it's not a transaction. It's not somebody who took the customer's money. And then in a subscription consumption world, which everything is moving towards every 30 days forever, you need your product to be adopted. In the business world, you need it to be habit forming in the consumer world like Netflix. If it's not adopted, if you go a couple of months without watching Netflix, you're going to look at that $15 on your credit card and get mad about it and cancel it. 
Same thing for any considered purchase now on a 30 day recurring or a one year recurring is that if it's not adopted, if it's not integrated, if it's not sticky, if there's not people every 30 days out there upselling, cross-selling, enriching, you're not going to drive your model. So that's post-purchase now. There's a whole set of partnerships. So the average customer today has seven different partners from the point they think they have a problem to those 28 moments, to the original point of sale, to every 30-day renewal forever. And now companies are trying to figure out who these seven companies or people are. And that's they, the difference today than last yeah, year. Yeah, nice, amazing. Oh, there's just so many ways and different areas we can take this. And there's so much great stuff there. I wanted to ask, I've got two questions written down and I'm sure Ben has a few others as well. But, you know, is anyone measuring something like attribution really well? There's an entire industry of attribution and it's yeah. grown up in the consumer space. And I'll call it the Kim Kardashian rule. So if you want to hire Kim on Instagram today to sell something like a t-shirt or a bracelet, it costs you a minimum of a million dollars. So somebody up in the CFO or somebody at the board level probably is interested to know, are we going to sell a million of these things to make it worth it? Yeah. So for decades now, there's been an attribution industry and companies like Impact and Partnerize and AWIN and others solved this problem. And they do it through affiliate links. They do it through affinity, ambassador, advocate. There's a bunch of business models that they solve for to do that attribution to hopefully you make $5 million on that $1 million payment to Kim Kardashian. Now, those companies that I just mentioned are raising hundreds of millions of dollars of private equity to move that consumer technology into B2B. If there's 28 people along bumps or moments along the journey before that point of vendor selection, I want to invest in technology that can see as many of those bumps as possible. Mm. And here's the future of marketing, very simply, is your marketing team in the average company is striving to get into those moments. And I'm going to say the most high value, best executed marketing campaign, you might get into three or four of those moments. Mm. Like for example, before you buy that car, you're going to go on to BMW or Mercedes or you know whoever's website and configure the car and price it and color it, learn about it. You might go and download the invoice price and the back-end rebates of the dealership. By the time you hit the dealership, you're so smart. You're smarter than the salesperson ever will be. You're smarter than the matter. You already know within $100 what you're going to be paying. This empowered customer through those 28 moments is everything. And the marketing people at BMW are trying to grab you for three or four of those moments. They know they're not going to grab you for all 28. You're going to read magazines. You're going to go to YouTube and watch videos. You're going to go and talk to your neighbors. You're going to go on Facebook and say, hey, I'm looking to buy a car. What, is, what do people think? You're going to do a lot of things. And if they can capture you, that's fantastic. But somebody's got to be sitting in that meeting at BMW and say, what about the other 24 moments that we don't own? Who's going out there? Because we can't buy that data anymore. Who's going out there to make nice with that YouTube videographer that's like doing drag strip racing with the car? Who's going out there to Motor Trend and Car and Driver and these magazines? Who's going out there to the podcasts they're listening to? You know, what are we doing from a partnership perspective to go find the other 24? Maybe we don't find all 24, but what if we found 10 or 15 of them? And not only could attribute what they are doing, the value of that moment towards them buying our car versus our competitor. So we could measure it, we could pay against that moment. But what if we could do a data sharing type of arrangement where there's now companies like Crossbeam, Reveal in Europe, Pronto, PartnerTap, and others that now augment attribution with data share. So not only am I listening to your podcast right now, but you're sharing from a business to business perspective, which is totally fine, government wide around the world, that business to business data so that they can see this moment and be able to properly attribute it to you, but also be able to share it across the other 27 moments and be able to come out with their marketing calculus of how much that moment is worth. Mm -hmm. And by the end, when they're making value, making that moment of um, vendor selection, I know whether to run a Super Bowl ad next year to sponsor Formula One, or I should be out on YouTube finding these micro influencers. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think like it sounds still very nascent in the B2B world, but there's been some heritage around the consumer space, which has proven the model because I like to say you want to look at influencing the influencers as well because it's, and it's through the ecosystems concept and everything in between. And I think the end of the cookie also signals around data brokerage from a consumer spec and you know, there's a whole digital privacy and, and human rights element and ethical dilemma that comes with all of this sort of stuff. We've seen that very prominently in cases like Cambridge Analytica and all the rest. And now it's like, how do we actually move that over to a B2B space, still make sure that it is ethical, move it into something that is measurable and actionable and insightful, but it still talks true at the end of the day to the whole ecosystems type of model and arrangement too, Jay, because no longer is anything linear or an A to B type of journey. It's this entire sphere. It's different moments, different touch points, different conversations, different influences. And I think that's the beauty of where the world is in, in a hyper-connected world and the beauty of humanity too. It, it really is. And, you know, we're not brokering uh, personal data. We're not um, living on an internet where you're the product. You know, this is a B2B space where people are sharing pertinent data yeah. to drive value for the end customer. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if I'm out looking for a car and happen to mention that in my Alexa device and my Google Home device and my Siri device and, you know, seven other things are listening and all of a sudden my social media feed is full of cars, now that seems a little bit invasive. But if I actually put it out there to say that, you know, there's 62 manufacturers of cars and there's 365 brands, one for every day of the year, I can't go visit 62 dealerships. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but I need to narrow that down to the kind of car, what my utility is, what my usage, blah, blah, blah. So I, I need help to go from this vast universe of whether it's security companies or cars before I set foot on the dealership. It would make sense that I, offer up, um, you know, to those companies, you know, that the fact that I'm perhaps a prospect and it's a value to me because now they can narrow down on what my needs are and who might be surrounding me and help me guide me in my mission. Because really what I'm trying to do is become educated and I'm trying to empower myself so that I make the best decision either for myself or for my company, depending personal or professional. But in the end, the psychology is the same. You know, we're trying to raise all boats here and we're trying to do it ethically and, and we're not trying to do it from a personal you know, perspective. So that changes, hopefully, everything. And we as consumers then get to decide as well. You know, yeah. part of GDPR and part of the other laws around the world is that we can opt out of this. So if I do go watch a video on YouTube or if I go and, you know, do something online, like listening to your podcast, I literally have a big button over on the corner that says opt out. So I'm not comfortable. I truly want to do this anonymously. And maybe I want to get right to vendor selection. All 28 moments, I want to be invisible. And that's totally fine. Hmm. Absolutely. All right, Jay, I've got so many to go into here. but uh, <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> the one you're talking to. I want to talk about behavioral consumerism and us as the product and specifically to what you just mentioned as the data sharing. So data sharing, whether it's bi-directional or even now omnidirectional, so central point of data collection to then sell onto multiple organizations for that data sharing capability. We're losing on average 22.5 million records a day due to breach uh, on mm -hmm. average. So the time we've spent talking here in the last half an hour, we've already lost a couple hundred thousand records as part of a data breach. As the consumer, I get concerned with that, which is why I want to be incognito or invisible to the vendor selection. You know, cookies are sometimes food. I get that from Sesame Street. But it's now got to the point where people understand what cookies are and therefore are trying to be untraceable to the cookie selection to then remove them in that behavioral consumerism piece. So the question behind that is, how do you see data sharing becoming more prominent with the rise of the incognito consumer? Yeah, it's a good question. Is uh, you know when data, when big data, you know when that kind of the tide turned psychologically from being something good for society to perhaps something that you know was dangerous. You know, people's opinions of their personal data and the protection of their personal data also went with that, and they're they're voting as well. 
in politicians around the world that you know support that. And you know, each day, including today, we've had uh, laws be put forward that further protect you know your privacy and your ability to be truly anonymous or incognito, and have more choice, and and understand more behind the layers what is being collected and you know what you might be okay with you know other sharing. But I will say you know before computers existed, there was obviously business to business sharing. Mm. When when you or your parents or grandparents bought a house, you know that real estate agent would be in behind the scenes working with um, a, a bank and, and mortgage broker. They'd be in behind the scenes working with lawyers, doing the contracts. They'd be in behind the scenes, perhaps with a roofer that needed to do some patching before the house could, you know, pass inspection and stuff. There's always been an ecosystem around business. You know, right back to the you know early days of trade. You know how things worked and how influence worked and how super connectors worked and things like that. Uh, what we're talking about now is on a level of scale that um, that we've never seen before, and the level of secrecy of you know our data actually being uh, monetized and, and quantified. And some of the biggest companies now in the world by valuation, you know, two of the biggest five grew to that size, multi-trillion-dollar valuations based on the pri- price of our privacy or our lack of knowledge of what the price of our mm-hmm. personal data was. And so that's, you know, we're at that turning point. And now we're, you know, as citizens, we're more empowered than ever before to know that. And we also have people in positions of political power and regulatory power, legislative power, compliance power, you know, to start to put in that. So Europe today literally has has put in three major you know pieces into their levels of compliance that go far beyond what GDPR attempted to do in the past. But the, you know that ability to protect ourselves uh, at scale and the ability for those big trillion dollar companies not to lead with their own products before other products you know that sit on their marketplace and these type of things are now being codified and so. That's good news because, you know, we had this conversation five or 10 years ago, we'd be saying the laws haven't caught up to, mm. you know, the yeah. dangers. And, and we, we would be saying that, um, you know, we need to find people that understand this problem and can figure out, you know, ways to somehow regulate these, the, these issues on, on behalf of us as, as citizens. But right now we're going through the phase of, uh, of seeing the early moments uh, of what this is going to look like. Do you know what those three editions were, Jay, from Europe? Yeah, I'm doing this right on memory because I read it about 30 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, yeah. One is definitely the Amazon, uh, being able to sell you Amazon basics yeah. mm-hmm. versus um, you know putting that at the top of the list versus a competitive product. Right. Uh, second is learning about that competitive product because they know everything about the, the purchase, purchase quantity, purchase timing, you know, price promotion, the four P's around that product, yep. they own the data and they could walk and build a competitive product for a penny less and yeah. you know, ship it a day sooner. So I know there's there, those two levels yep. of what one is prioritizing your own product over someone on your marketplace. Given that post pandemic or where we are in the pandemic, one third, the US economy runs through marketplaces. You know, the, the fact that Amazon can put their batteries, their AA batteries ahead of Energizer and Duracell for a penny less and have them delivered in four hours versus, you know, two days. And batteries are kind of usually something you order when you need them. It's just ridiculously unfair. I mean, you don't have to work for <laughs> Duracell or Energizer to kind of feel that that feels unfair because they now have, you know, over 10 years of sales data to the seventh decimal point on these companies. They probably have better data about those two companies than they have internally, those companies. Than the companies themselves. The way they sell, you know, Energizer and Duracell sell 100% of their products indirect. So they're relying on retailers, then moving through wholesalers and distributors. So I will tell you how bad their data is Hmm. and how they attempt to cleanse it using technology and stuff. But they don't even have their own good decision grade data on go to market. Yeah. Where Amazon actually has literally up to date 100% accurate data 
yeah. that they would love to have, but guess what? Amazon's not sharing it. And now they're competing with them, selling AA batteries. So those two things were definitely part of it. Uh, the privacy laws to take you know, GDPR kind of into the future mm -hmm. uh, was the next part of it. I'll have to look up the kind of- Yeah, the yeah, no worries. Yeah, super interesting. I'm reading um, The Right to Think by Susie Allegre at the moment. She's an uh, international human rights lawyer and she talks about a lot of the digital privacy and what our rights are online and sort of the transparency required around data sharing and what you were talking about just then, Jay, as it relates to Amazon. It's very like anti-competition sort of, you know, laws and, and the ACCC spec here. Yeah. So, you know, it's all about equitable and fair and, you know, healthy competition as opposed to I've got all of the data points and all the information and I'm going to trump you <laughs> and continue on the journey of multi-trillion dollar valuations, you know. Hey, Jay, you mentioned uh, Marketplace and, and you talked through the history of the ecosystems of trade uh, and how that started you know many moons ago in the spice trade and that really talks to the heritage of marketplace you know there were marketplaces where people would gather to sell as that central point of marketplace we've now moved to digital marketplace uh, and as you mentioned earlier a third of the u.s economy is being driven through marketplace with the i'm going to call it monopolization of product uh, in those marketplaces a lot of our listeners will work for organizations that relies that resale as a bar or you know in in tech industry or or beyond how do you see the impact of marketplace and the monopolization that's currently occurring and the the long-term future of of those resellers that rely on uh, the indirect sell touching the customer as part of the um, i think you called it earlier the uh, ecosystem of influence and they're, they're part of that influence in one of those 28 decisions yeah, so we can go a lot of directions with marketplace. I'll just go a couple of them. Uh, yeah. One is that um, there's a demographic change that's happening. Uh, in four years uh, around the world, the majority of buyers of B2B will be uh, millennial. Mm -hmm. um, so these are digital natives that grew up digitally, either you know acquiring things through app stores, acquiring music, acquiring entertainment, acquiring you know games. Everything has been digital. And, and part of the generation digital subscription. So, you know, moving into buyers that are buying millions of dollars of, you know, software products and other things, this is carrying forward. That ease of use, that idea of um, uh, frictionless buying mm. carries forward with them. Having, you know, Larry in the white van chase down a bunch of companies, get special pricing, arrange it and go get a partnership built so they can provide special pricing and then putting that on a single bill and waiting 30 days for that single bill, single quote. Are, are gone. Yeah. So a couple of things are also happening in the SaaS world. You know, a lot of the subscription consumption world that I talked about earlier, the average SaaS deal, like if you buy, for example, Salesforce, talk about a SaaS company that's 20 years old, going to approach a trillion dollar valuation, I think within this decade, uh, the average Salesforce deal has six other pieces of SaaS combined with it on the app exchange, which is their marketplace. So this idea that you're going to pave that last mile from a technology perspective with not only the product like a HubSpot, a Marketo, a Workday, a ServiceNow, but you're going to buy six other things minimum behind it. And that's growing to pave that last mile. Uh, you're not going to pr procure and provision those things in different places. Usually you acquire them, let's say, on a per user basis or on a per consumption basis. It makes more sense to procure all that together. And if you go up or down a user, it's one click of the mouse. And to get the human-based contracting out of the way and to make this a digital subscription that I can you know, turn on or turn off at a moment's notice. That's number one. Uh, number two is the marketplace it's, itself has the ability not only from a software perspective, but when you're building out a solution, there could be hardware. There could be obviously a ton of services. Salesforce, for example, was the first company ever to come out with this idea of a multiplier. And what we used to call it in the industry is total cost of ownership. Mm. And I used to sell PCs for Lenovo and IBM at scale, and we would avoid the topic because it wasn't a good one. We created the managed services industry because the TCO of client server was so bad. And now it's a $200 billion industry. Well, guess what? Salesforce turned it upside down and said, for every dollar of our software that we sell, it costs you customer $4.32 to get it to work. 
This was like five years ago. And so let it be known, you're going to buy six other pieces of software. We know you are. That's about a dollar of that. But you can expect $3.32 you know, to go to integrators, to go to managed service providers, to go to others, to go get this whole thing to work and implement it and keep it running. So in that world, if you're going to spend $100,000 with us, if that's your budget, I hope you have a half a million dollars in the bank to get it to work. Well, guess what? You know, Salesforce has updated that. It's now like $6.19. But all the major tech providers have gone into this language. Microsoft went into the press last year with a big blitz that said they're unlocking trillions of dollars for the channel. And that's basically telling customers that for every dollar of Microsoft, there's upwards of $9 that a customer pays to get it to work. And now AWS and Google and everybody else seems to be following suit with these multipliers. Even to implement HubSpot, it's $5.80 for every dollar of HubSpot to get it to work. I hope you have 600 grand in the bank to get this thing to work for digital agencies and all the other ones that uh, come in to be. So this multiplier effect becomes really important for marketplaces. So if I walk into a marketplace and you know I have some enterprise credits hanging around at a certain marketplace, there's 20 marketplaces that I think will win 80% of the trillions of dollars that will go through marketplaces one day. Uh, in those enterprise credits, I can start thinking differently. I need to acquire software, hardware, services, everything. What if I could acquire all $6 in one place? And now the marketplace is the one that pays out Accenture. They're the one that pay out that MSSP, the security mm. provider. They're the one that pay out that consultant, designer, architect. They're the ones that pay out everybody, the software companies. So now I have a single bill for my entire department. And I'm running my entire sales, marketing, operations, finance, HR department on a single platform. And that platform runs the marketplace that I procure and provision everything else on. Boy, would my CFO love me. <laughs> Boy, would this make my life easy in terms of being able to manage all these moving parts. Yeah, that's huge. So there's three <laughs> parts of marketplace in the future. So if you truly believe the world you know, is going to move this way. Subscription and consumption models live on marketplaces. Yeah. You don't buy Netflix from your cable guy in the white van. You know, every month he drives by and you run out to the you know street and hand him 15. No, it just runs on a it runs on a marketplace. It runs on a digital subscription. In this future as well, you've got marketplaces which are kind of the consumer marketplaces, Amazon and Alibaba's of the world. But they all have now the Amazon for business and Alibaba for business. In the world, it's consumption. Where do I buy my toner for my printer? Where do I buy the paper? Where do I buy all the, like, the day in and day out things that I, don't, I shouldn't even be thinking about? It should be sitting on an internet of things way scale. And when it gets down to a certain weight of paper, it triggers a back end order. And I can order that from a local dealer. I can, I can order it from a big retailer. I can order it from a big market. I don't care. It's just I want to set it and forget it, kind of like my peanut butter. When it gets down to a certain weight, <laughs> I want a new jar of peanut butter to automatically, automatically appear in my pantry. There's certain things, 80% of my life is consumption-based. And once I make a decision on what kind of laundry detergent and what kind of peanut butter I like, until I make a change, just set it and forget it. And, and that's kind of a big part of marketplaces is that ability to set your life and forget it, your business life and forget it. Now. The next marketplaces I mentioned, the 20, the big hyperscalers, the big SaaS companies, you've got your traditional SAPs and Oracles and IBMs. You've got the Dell and Cisco's who are going to figure it out shortly. You know, security, we don't really have somebody that's stepped out in the marketplace world yet and is ready to put together these 4,300 companies in a stack. But I think that's going to come soon. But there's going to be probably 20 marketplaces that drive 80% of the activity. And then finally, you've got this independent or niche marketplaces. If I want to set up a marketplace for security in Australia, serving the insurance market, I can set up a marketplace. Well, today or yesterday, I would have set up a wireframe on WordPress and put little icons out there and done a little e-commerce thing. Well, it's getting too big now to do that. Mm. To compete with some of the other marketplaces, I have to have more functionality. So it's now a buy versus build conversation. 
there's 150 marketplace development firms that I can buy to you know, set up my marketplace on my website. Well, five of them in the last six months have now been chosen pretty much the winners. So in the US, a company like AppDirect is raising hundreds of millions of dollars and you know, Wall Street is declaring them one of the marketplace winners. In Europe, a company like Miracle with a K raised $555 million, somewhat declared as the winner. And you know, a small company in Canada, Vendasta, raised 120 million. So companies are starting to break away from the pack and become the sales forces and the hub spots and the workday. They're becoming those five in the marketplace development. And so if I want to set up any marketplace that's more niche oriented in front of a buyer, in front of a sub-industry, in front of a geography, in front of a sector of the market, like SMB, in front of a product type, like one of the seven layers of security. I want to set up an endpoint security uh, marketplace. Or if I want to set up a marketplace that's on a delivery model, like managed services. I can take all six of those and I can mix them together. There's 35 million permutations of where I can go set up a marketplace starting tomorrow. Mm. And because I'm focused, customers might actually come and say, hey, I don't want to rip through Amazon trying to find what I need or AWS trying to find what I need. It seems like you're speaking my language because I live in Australia and I run an insurance company. It seems like you've thought this through and you've vetted who's on the marketplace. And it seems like I'm going to be compliant and, and apply to any regulation in my local industry because you've done the work for me. That may make sense to me to procure what I need from you. Mm. Tough to drive the attention there, though, when there is a very big competitive landscape across marketplaces. So this is the whole other point of my research, which I call community research. So now I'm in Australia. Now I'm in, in the insurance industry. I've got myself down a rabbit hole here. But <laughs> I'm, I'm differently. I'm still stuck on the peanut butter consumption yeah. model. We're just... <laughs> and so I, I won't even tell you that there are 7,000 insurance companies in Australia, because there is. Now I'm in this market and I'm trying to figure out how to get my marketplace better positioned than Amazon. Mm. who's in the region, they've got local data centers, they're pushing hard. Um, so how do I do it? Well, guess what? In those 7,000 companies, there's an average of eight people per company. I can now start managing out by three questions. What do insurance people that might be worried about security and a breach that might put them out of business, what do they read? Where do they go? And who do they follow? Three pretty simple questions. Three questions that can all be answered via Google and a $10 an hour intern. But I can actually start to find in their watering holes, the different peer groups they're in, the different communities, the different associations, you know, any local magazines I can read. I, I can look at the local social groups on Facebook and LinkedIn and Reddit and Discord and Slack. I can start going through 14 spheres of influence to collect what their body of reading is about security. So they've got a lens into them, an aperture into security, and there's voices speaking to them through these watering holes. That's number one. Number two, there are these voices. And everything, if you've ever read The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, there's this law of a few. You think that there's millions of things in the solar system all flying around. Well, it always rolls back to about 100 people. In, and if I spent the next day or two analyzing all those watering holes and downloading all the podcasts, downloading all the, the conversations and everything else going on, I'm going to roll it into about 100 people that are speaking to these 7,000 companies, insurance companies in Australia, literally 100 people, which I can find who they are. And because they're somewhat narcissistic, they're, they want to be seen and they're into all these different watering holes, they like to see their name and lights. They're really easy to find that they're easy to actually categorize how important they are from number one to number 100. There's an easy algorithm you can run to go find those 100 people. Now, the third thing, so that's what they read. That's where they go. What are the events? Now, I want to double click. I want to go in, into Sydney or Melbourne. I want to go into Brisbane. I want to go uh, fly over to Hamilton Island for a nice little event. What am I going to listen to? Who am I listening to? And who's putting on that event? The local magazine, the local association, the local chamber of commerce. You know, I can kind of 
back into this entire view. And now what I read, where I go, and especially who I follow, if I want to win security in the insurance space in Australia, it's literally a hundred people in all of these 14 spheres of influence. That's the entire answer. There's nothing outside of that. And I've got, you know, a bunch of actions and tactics that I could do, go and win that space. If I want to start a marketplace there, I can, but literally, you know, you come back to how do you win from a grassroots community level upwards? That's the idea. Love it. Amazing. Well, yeah. <laughs> I've run out of rinse and repeat. Page. Rinse and repeat, by the way, 35 million times. Yeah, totally. I want to win banks in Japan. Just take everything I just said, rinse and repeat. It's a new hundred people. It's a new set of watering holes, but it's all the same 14 spheres. You know, it might be new names and faces, but how you do it is identical. Same concept. What about, same concept. What about globally, Jay? Same concept? Maybe. Well, same concept. Yeah. We're, a, you know, we're just a bunch of villages. We're just a bunch of communities. And yeah. because we're connected by internets now and computers, you know, we don't have to live in the same town. We're not gathering around the same marketplace. We're not gathering around the same watering holes. Most of the watering holes now are digital. But this yeah. allows me because there's such a bigger audience now, you know, bordering on almost 8 billion people now, I can find people in these very specific niches. Again, I care about insurance companies in Australia, <laughs> but, you know, if I can get into that nth level, I can literally find my people. I don't just have to go to a generic insurance conference. I don't have to go to a generic security conference. I don't have to go to a generic I can or Australia conference. I can literally take all three of those things and go find my people who are lifting you know, the boats, who are the most vocal, who are the most knowledgeable and can get me to the outcome and hopefully keep me from being fired or my company from going bankrupt because of a breach. Yeah, absolutely. When are you coming to Australia next, Jay? I was there every year before COVID. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm coming to Singapore in November. Uh, I just got invited to a speech, um, but I'm looking to get back. Last nice. time I, yeah. I brought my kids. Uh, we took the wrong way around the world and went to 15 countries on the way to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. my kids have now been to 85 countries uh, doing these kind of journeys. So I love wow. it. Yeah, it's awesome. We have to let us know when you are, when you are here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still stuck on the peanut butter consumption analogy there. Yes, so I'll move you <laughs> Have you made your choice of peanut butter? The one crunchy or, or smooth, you're ready to go with it? Look, I'm going to throw something out that's probably going to be controversial. Is I don't really enjoy the taste of peanut butter. I know. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, but Ben, I mean, you put your sauce in like... Where yeah. You, Actually, bar, Jay, here's a good question for you. Yeah, where do you keep your, your ketchup? Uh, in the fridge. In the fridge. Yeah. See, I keep it in the cupboard. So yeah. weird. Is well, that weird? They just, you know, it's just like one part tomato, 99 parts sugar, right? Yeah, so it'll right. stay forever. Yeah, you what? can put it anywhere in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Partially because the mustard and the relish, everything goes in the fridge together. So if you have a, bat or a burger or a hot dog, you're not like fishing in different places. Yeah, yeah it's not see, a big I'm, I'm the one with 10 fishing poles in different directions <laughs> to pull them all out for the one meal. So your peanut butter consumption might be different than anyone else's. But if you have guests over, if you have kids, whatever, like you always have to have peanut butter. That's it's right. It's literally a staple that has to be in your cupboard, but you might just need one jar every six months where somebody else might need it every six days. Yeah. Well, my kids would challenge that consumption if they lift that, they would work out pretty quickly that if they lifted it up, a new bottle would arrive uh, and they would just be doing this all day and I'd have 20 <laughs> bottles of peanut butter. Because that's there's, a funny, there's a funny story there. Amazon who thought that, you know, when you're stocking your shelves, they built little Amazon buttons and there were little IOT buttons run on a battery. So when you, you know, got to the end of your laundry detergent and your tide thing was empty and you took it out of the cupboard, there was a tide button right behind it. And then right on that last load of laundry, you just press the button, triggers your Amazon device, next day tide comes. <laughs> and so I invested in this because I thought it was brilliant. Like yeah. one for the peanut butter and one for my paper towels and one for my tide. I thought it's tactile. So it's not some AI engine just keeps sending me peanut butter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like something like when I run out, I can officially get something replaced. Well, my kids got this and like 20 or 30 different buttons around the house. 
It was now a game of hide and seek. So they would literally run around the house pressing buttons. <laughs> you know, we saw these orders just load up and we had now like 10 pairs of peanut butter and 10 things to hide. And so this tactile thing, and then Amazon ended up shutting it down because that's not the way the human brain works. Because yeah. your family, Jay, just too many. <laughs> well, for kids, it doesn't work to have any button that has a little light on it that you can press a hundred times. And there's just no way for AI to, you know, figure out whether that was a kid pressing it or a yeah. you know, real life emergency yeah. that you're out of uh, peanut butter. I literally imagine that happening in the Sully fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, I would I would go one step further, having a biometric, so you could only have you know that button had a biometric sensor on it that was only eligible for myself or my wife to be able to do it. That would be sort of the, the new age of that. But I can just imagine Jeff Bezos in the boardroom saying, look at Jamie Bain's family. This is the reason we need to shut this down, guys. That's right. I, I think uh, we partially sent him into space, our, our families. <laughs> but here, here's the deal, though. is um, it, It's important to what we're talking about. Am I okay with Jeff Bezos knowing my laundry detergent and peanut butter consumption? My answer is completely 100% yes. Because over time, and you know, you go in peaks and valleys and stuff, and sometimes you do more laundry, sometimes you do less. But if you could put that up against public data and go put that just for fun up against the weather, go put that the daily weather where I live, go put that up against the NFL football schedule, go put that up against a million different data points on the internet and try for an AI engine to get predictive and prescriptive. The answer is you're going to start to find things that I wouldn't even know. Mm about my football team losing and I'm soiling my clothes or the you know weather drives more laundry. But those are the types of things where it gets really interesting. So would AI be, be able to better predict my consumption of everything I do in my life, or at least 80% of it? Or would it be something more physical like IoT? Because the paper on my printer, the peanut butter, the laundry detergent, would it be better off to have a scale and when it gets down to a certain predetermined limit that I decide that the next day, literally, you know, the, the thing lands on my front door. And at some point, I, would I trust somebody to just come in and stock my shelves for me? If they're bonded and AAA certified and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> would I literally allow somebody into my house so that I would set it and forget it and actually never run out of these things and not have to stock my own shelves? My answer is yes, but your answer may be no. And there might be a thousand people in the middle of us with nuanced answers in that bell curve. And that's where I think the future of psychology goes and the future of our ability to control from a security perspective, who knows what that fits within our own perspective, our own religious beliefs, our own personal beliefs and, and everything else. And if there's 8 billion people on earth that can make those own decisions, that's where we need to go. Yeah, to I be. totally, totally agree. It's going to. And if somebody it, disrespects you and, and starts yeah. sending you peanut butter, they should be in jail. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. it, it, there's got to be laws in place. Yeah. They literally so, say no. Yeah. And if somebody breaks that trust, you know, they should be flamed on Twitter and they should be made fun of on Reddit. But, you know, the executives who decided to break that trust, you know, should have ramifications. Totally. Uh, don't send, don't, don't send Ben the refrigerated ketchup. Or... Yeah, I just don't understand putting cold ketchup on hot things, but I digress. <laughs> hey, Jay, potentially lastly, just back to one third in the US, you know, through marketplaces, a bit more laggards down under, we're getting there. It's still really the rise of marketplaces for us. I'd be interested to know if you've got any advice to offer up for, for our channel community and our partners in terms of that big market trend and how they can better equip themselves and continue along the value path with the rise of, you know, digital commerce and consumption based models. Yeah. So Ben said it and I didn't respond to it, but I can now is this is a big risk for the channel. You know, when I mentioned 75% of world trade goes indirectly, you know, for hundreds of years, this is how companies and small businesses have built their businesses around predictive revenue and earning a percent for their, you know, a gas station, you know, gets 10% for every liter that you pump into your car. And we, we just assume that all these local businesses, our neighbors get paid for the services, localized services that they provide. Mm -hmm. 
Now, this is really a direct play. When you're spending money with Amazon or Microsoft and you're doing it on their marketplace, they record that revenue as direct. Microsoft, I'm going to talk about them because they've made the biggest changes publicly in and around this space that affect channels um, this year. One is that they used to talk about 90% of their business being partner sourced was mm. the language they used. And you buy Office 365, you buy Windows. I mean, it's all partner reseller assisted somehow or retail. Well, as Azure started to grow and now they've outgrown AWS and Google 10 straight quarters and they're growing this business 50% quarter in quarter out year on year, like this is just insane amounts of growth. It's not hitting those numbers anywhere close. The majority of buyers are either acquiring it direct, marketplace, resale. It's a bigger mix than ever before. Same goes for everyone else in the cloud world. So in a world that may be you know, two thirds to three quarters indirect in the past, in the future world, as software eats the world and the security industry and everything else, we're starting to see a much different percentage of partner sourced. And Microsoft changed over two years ago to partner assisted. Mm. Back to attribution. They say that 96% of their business is partner assisted, but they'll no longer state how much of it is actually sourced just because the number's dropping. And that's because customers want to do it this way. And this is a you know balance of, of how things are going to get acquired in the future. But then they quickly turned into that trillion dollar number, which is how much each of those dollars creates, but not for resellers, but for resellers who have transitioned their business into more service models, doing the managed services, doing the procurement services, doing the implementation, the integration, the security. So there's all kinds of services that get triggered for every dollar of Microsoft. And that's where they're trying to push people to where that multiplier is. And if you fast forward to this year, they dropped about four or five bombs on the channel in four or five weeks. One is they came out with what's called an NCE, new commerce experience. Every company in a subscription model is gonna to have to create one of these. Today, they have a different model for every distributor. If it gets sold through NextGen, it records one way. If it gets sold through Ingram, another. Tech Data, TD Cynics, another. I mean, literally every VAD, every distributor, every point of sale has its own system. And then a huge amount of complexity to try to bring that into a single object. Well, mm -hmm. today, Microsoft has a single object for every subscription. It's with that customer. And if that customer wants to move from direct to marketplace, to indirect, all in a given week, they own the network object with that customer. And the new commerce experience is what Dell with Apex and Cisco with Cisco Plus and HPE with GreenLake and every company that's moving to the subscription model is what car companies, when you acquire transportation as a service in the future, at least our kids will. It will be an object itself that the reseller doesn't own. It's a connection to the manufacturer which has that object. That's one. Two is they you know, did a price increase. Three is they shifted all risk to the channel. And so if a customer cancels the subscription after 72 hours, it's poor Larry in the white van that has to pay out that contract for a year. That's never going to survive, but they did that in the middle of a bunch of other things. So it was shock and awe. So no one knew what to get mad at, you know, across these things. But the EU and the US government and others are not going to allow that where a multi-trillion dollar, the second richest company in the world mm -hmm. somehow has a very small business carrying the load for them from a risk. Yeah. That's not going to, you know, that's not going to be a long-term thing, but it is today that the channel holds the risk for Microsoft and any 2008, 2000 pandemic level market disruption or the disruption we're going through right now is basically the channel that's going to hold the risk. Then the biggest thing that they did was a point system. So when I talked about those early 28 moments, when I talked about transaction assist, when I talked about every 30 days forever, the, all the alliances they have, the tech alliances, Microsoft's created an algorithm that looks like Google SEO, which assigns points for different value things across the equation. And so to make this magic 70 out of 100, which is the point system to become a, there's no gold, silver, bronze anymore, but this is to become a recognized kind of platinum level partner. To reach 70, is almost impossible through resell alone. Unless you're like a CDW and a fortune-sized company, there's no way to meet that via resell. 
Second is in all their points and how they chopped up all the points, they put two thirds of them against the end of the cycle, which is the retention renewal. So in terms of spreading like peanut butter, they kind of pushed it backwards, partially because they're outgrowing AWS and Google. They don't need the help up front, mm -hmm. maybe at this particular moment. But in the next couple of quarters, if you see Google and AWS start to outgrow them, they now own the algorithm that they can start to move the points, the money back to the beginning and start paying more at those 28 moments so that they can get back on track. But in the end, they own this point system, which is like an airline point system. You don't know how it's calculated. You don't know how much that you're going to earn at the end. I mean, th there's a lot of vagueness to it, but Microsoft's now in control and they're allowed to move money away from the point of sale with abandon. And I think most companies are going to follow into this point system where you're not paying out that front and back end margin the way you used to, because the point of sale now is only the point of the first 30 days with the customer. Right now, companies are paying out everything at the point of sale, assuming the partner did everything to get them there and will do everything to keep them a customer for life. And it's just broken because you want to be able to measure every moment and pay on every moment and spread it like peanut butter if you can through a point system. And this is what resellers now see publicly. Microsoft being one of the biggest vendors in the space have now gone public. It was so much change so quickly, the channel chief, the global channel chief quit after less than a year on the job. It's a lot, but this is one of those early indicators of if you're talking about the decade of the ecosystem, if you're looking forward, what are all these other companies in every industry of everything we buy as people and as business people? As everything goes into these new models, you can assume that the channels are going to have these new commerce experiences. They're going to have these point systems. They're going to have different relationships than we've had in the past, which is basically gross to net based paying at the point of sale. Yeah, for sure. You're almost then, moving away the incentive and the reward from the upfront sort of traditional product resell into retention and annuities and all the Wherever rest. it's important at that Where particular it's important, moment yeah. in time. Yeah. Like Google can change their SEO algorithm on a moment's notice, mm. call it Penguin or something. And, and there's people that li literally wake up every day trying to figure out what changes they made overnight to the algorithm. The same is going to go for programs. Vendors... And it's not partner friendly as much as it could be. It's not customer friendly in some cases, really, really vendor friendly, some of these changes. And obviously the move to subscription and consumption models, the move into marketplace, all this is really vendor friendly for driving valuations and other things. And this is something to watch. If you're a reseller and you've lived for years on margins, I, and I, I would look at my big 10 vendors or big 20 vendors that I, that I rely on, and I'd start to look for clues into their ecosystem thinking. Yeah. Uh, I just think, you know, for, for decades now, we've been talking about kind of this end of resale. It's never happened and it never will happen because there'll always be customers and at least a third of customers, if not more, that want to buy this way, but it's not going to be at the percentages that we've had in the past and companies are going to respond. Yeah. My two cents on it, I think elasticity of trade is what consumers are looking for. Uh, and with that, the, for the reseller ecosystem or the partner ecosystem in the channel, it's gone from partner sourced over or traditionally partner sourced over the top of partner influence. That's completely flipped with marketplace. Partner influence is the critical missing piece that potentially vendors can't attribute. So with that, you know, I, I'm forecasting partners into different service models that look like, you know, an accredited customer success partner to maintain that 30 days forever. Uh, and these types of, you know, different consumer based profiling. Just learn those three things. You yeah. know, your vendors need to get customers to the dance. They need to get them on the dance floor. And then they need to keep them dancing all night long. If you're building a business that can do one, two, or three of those things, you need to find vendors that can measure that. You perhaps should share data with them yeah. to help them better measure that and ask them to be paid for all the investments you're making on their behalf which is saving them money from hiring marketing, sales, and customer success folks. You are their, not just their salespeople, which you have been in the past. You are now customer success, CX, and marketing. You're everything to these vendors. 
and you should be paid accordingly for that. Big era of disruption, very interesting times. This is the decade of the ecosystem. It's, it's good, <laughs> good times ahead and we're only in the you know, early stages, you know, year one, year two of this you know, kind of set of stages, set of uh, uh, changes that, that we're going through. Yeah, absolutely. Jay, have you got anything else that you wanted to offer up to the audience down here? No, well, globally, think... actually, we've got a few, we've got a lot of global listeners. So. We do actually, yeah. 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 Well, I think that, um, you know, we're in that kind of era of change. But if I go back to the beginning and with two numbers and, and say, number one, 76% of your end clients think that their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. Every client in every industry, in every town, city, province around the world, are going through massive transformations around how they're gonna work with customers, their customers. If you can be on the inside of that, there's huge opportunities to help them drive their businesses forward and digitize, become tech companies in many cases themselves, regardless of the industry that they're in. The other thing is every dollar, and this goes back to the start of time again, drives a lot of multiplication. And you should be focusing in your own business on the things that you do and the areas that you're focused on and getting closer to that multiplier because that's your business building. If you are today going out to a deal and collecting 50 cents or potentially collecting 50 cents for every dollar that's going into the solution, try to find your way from 50 cents to a dollar. You know, you don't have to become a developer, but you could. You could add on another ISV to that seven layer stack and you could use no code, low code and find yourself 50 cents of more market TAM. You've doubled the size of your company's market TAM by doing that. Or you can walk over into all the other parts of the pie chart. If there's integration and implementation services that you're not doing, but could either build those skills, build a practice, do a merger acquisition, something to get you there. Now you've gone from a dollar to $2 for every dollar of solution. If there's some compliance work, security work, if there's some continuity work, if there's some data automation work, if there's some emerging tech that you can add into the, the fray, the IoT, AI, blockchain, quantum, um, metaverse, if you could add self-driving or drone, whatever else it is, you know, maybe you could find your way to another dollar. But where you find the most successful partners today, like an Accenture, for example, they're trying to get themselves to that $6. They're trying to get themselves to that $9. And they're acquiring companies to do that. Accenture, if you just look at their acquisitions in Australia, the majority of acquisitions have actually been digital agencies. Why would they be buying marketing agencies? Well, guess who's now spending more money on technology in companies than the CIO? It's CMO. the CMO in many companies. Yeah. So if I'm going to serve that CMO and if I'm going to offer up 9,932 MarTech and ad tech tools, and I'm going to be the one doing the implementation, integration, concierge, creative services, and all the pie chart behind it. If I'm going to participate in that $5.80 that HubSpot's offering up, if I'm Accenture, who just added hundreds of thousands of people to their company over the pandemic, I'm going to go acquire up everything I need to get to that biggest multiplier possible. You don't have to be Accenture. You can have a company with a couple of technicians and just stare at the multiplier and stare where, you know, perhaps you could build out some adjacent services and go find yourself a dollar for every vendor dollar that you're working with. Amazing. Great advice, Jay. Yeah. Awesome insights too. The, the way we wrap up the dark mode episode, Jay, is we ask our guests to give us their best dark mode story. Wow. <laughs> it's usually the response we get, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, it can be anything, Jay. We've had, uh, we've had some really real doozies that probably bend the rules of law. Yeah. We've so, also so had... so... My, my favorite one is, um, and we all have these moments that we'd like to take back. Uh, mine's a professional moment that I would like to take back. But uh, when I was working for a big uh, laptop manufacturer, uh, one of the biggest in the world, um, I took all my partners on this um, big event, you know, to another city. We went through a big tour of the plant. We did all these wonderful things that you do with your best of your best partners. 
And on the way home, I mean, we basically took up most of the plane on the way home. I happened to be sitting near the front. And my boss had asked me for a direct presentation the next day. And so without a filter on my screen and without any knowledge about people behind you and adjacent to you on an airplane, here I am after whining and dining my best partners in Canada for a few days. Here I am working on how my company could grow our direct business. Oh, no. You have like three hours to sit on a plane and you're sitting behind somebody, you know, they got to read the slides as I'm building them. Yeah, that was my security moment that I wish I could take back. And I don't know how I wasn't fired, but holy smokes, was that a tough one to uh, yeah. talk our way out of. Yeah, what a moment. You needed the old dark mode privacy screen back then, Jay. I needed a privacy screen. I needed the intelligence not to be working on an <laughs> a anti-strategy in front of your in front of your friends. I mean, I needed maybe a brain or something. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a moment that jumps to mind quickly. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, thank Thanks, you for Jay. sharing that, Jay. Yeah, <laughs> and thank you for the conversation over the last hour too. It's been really insightful as we knew it would be and we look forward to doing it again in the future and of course be sure to let us know when you do come back down to australia and visit so thanks All very right. much for your time well do thanks, thanks for having me thanks mm -hmm. jay Bye.